Welcome to Hope from the Ashes, preparing for an evangelizing Lent. I'm Father Frank Donio of the Palatine Fathers and Brothers, the founding director of Catholic Apostolate Center, and I'm together with author of the book, Hope from the Ashes, Insights and Resources for Welcoming Lenten Visit Visitors uh, by Paul Jarzembowski, and Paul is the Associate Director for Laity at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So welcome, Paul. It's good to be with you, Father Frank. Uh, thank you very much for having me. We're going to start uh, with a prayer. We welcome all those who are joining us, and let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, as we come together and as we recognize your presence among us, we ask that you may help and guide us to truly be a welcoming people, not only on Ash Wednesday, but on that particular day as we have many who come and enter into the Lenten season, that we may be a welcoming presence, a hospitable presence, a group that will accompany others uh, in their Lenten journey and far beyond. We ask that you may bless and guide Paul as he talks with us today and in his continued work, not only in this work of, of assisting in raising consciousness in this area, but also in all of his many works that he does to assist the church in so many different ways, both here in this country and in many others throughout the world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, Paul, uh, you know, a few years ago, you did a webinar with us on this topic. And, it, you know, we were really excited. It's been one of our more popular webinars. It's something that we emphasize when we have our, our Lenten resources. So why a book? And this is, you know, this is not like a, a little a, a little piece here. This 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 book by Paulus Press, uh, published by Paulus Press, uh, just came out recently. Uh, and, and in fact, it's in its second printing, uh, which is really exciting, which means people are very interested in it. But, you know, figure like, OK, Ash Wednesday, you know, like how much is he going to write about? This isn't a, a sacramental theology treatise, but it has elements of that. It has elements of evangelization, it has all sorts of things. It's a couple hundred pages, uh, well documented also. So what prompted you to, to move from, you know, you make a lot of presentations. So why uh -huh. this and, and what really prompted you to move in that direction with a book? Well, thank you for asking. Um, when I... When I first started presenting on this topic, it was actually as generally as part of my 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 general work with engaging audiences and consulting with them on how to better engage with uh, with youth or with young adults. And there's a myriad of possibilities of engaging. Uh, but one thing that I have found early in my time is this observation that year after year, young people, especially those who are disconnected from the faith, uh, do come back on Ash Wednesday, and that is something that 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 drives people back into a sense of faith and sacredness each year. And so, because of that, um, it, it, what would happen in my presentations is that would be the time when a lot of people would would lean in a little bit more, and they'd ask a lot more questions. And 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 usually, when I had when I was at the end of a presentation, someone either there was a Q and A session in a in a in a webinar or at a live presentation, people would stay afterwards to ask even more and more, and what can I do? And uh, and then it started to come to a point where I started taking ideas during the presentation and said, okay, fine, let's, let's talk about this. And I had so many ideas that were just so illuminating for me um, that I, I, I felt like a presentation wasn't enough to really get a lot of the ideas. People were asking for a lot of practical things. What can I do? Like it's it's a very interesting phenomenon. It's very nice to think about, but but what is it that I can do in my community that um, that can make a difference? And so the book it does certainly. I'd say the first part of my book is very similar to some of the presentations I've given, but the second half or even the second two thirds is filled with ideas that people have shared with me and that I've seen work um, in this in this conversation. So I wanted a place to put that. And surprisingly, um, while there is a lot of books on many other sacramental moments, uh, any other moments in the life of the church, um, surprisingly, Lent and Ash Wednesday, there's not a lot of books out there that mm -hmm. give, number one, that talk about it, and especially very few 
that give resources of what can you actually do when I get done reading this. Um, and that's one of the reasons I wrote it was because I wanted a place where a person in the pews, uh, an active Catholic, a Catholic leader, a pastor, a parish council member could just pick it up and say, all right, let's, let's try something. Um, and, and, and instead of sitting there and having another meeting to figure out what that thing is, I, I offer a few starting suggestions and that's Great. really where it came from. So, so then why Ash Wednesday? Why, why is Ash Wednesday a day that brings infrequent churchgoers back to the church? And, and you, you are very ecumenical also in, in this. Yeah. And so it's not just a Catholic phenomenon, you, you've said. So what about Ash Wednesday? What is it about? Yeah, and that's the, that's the interesting thing. Uh, Ash Wednesday is not just a Catholic thing. It's, it's a Christian thing because we've had it. We've had Ash Wednesday long before... Uh, the schisms and reformations and 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 divisions in our church. Um, Ash Wednesday has been with us since uh, since almost the beginning. And actually, the 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 whole idea of sackcloth and ashes uh, reaches back into uh, into the Hebrew scriptures. And as I was doing more research, I found it even went back further than that. That people were engaged in sackcloth and ashes and the notion of uh, 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 this penitential experience. Was something that that predates even the starting the writing of the Bible. So, uh, you know, societies from almost the very beginning of humanity were engaged in this. So, um, so what is it about ashes? I, I part of it, you know, goes back to that history. It's been with us for a while. It's something that's that since you know, I I use the cliche since our caveman days, we've been doing this. It's been, it's part of the human experience. There is something about reflecting on our uh, on that mortality. There is something that is that is part of that that draws people in. But then with overlay that with Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Methodist uh, overlays of the fact that now Ash Wednesday, brings with it a sense of belonging, a sense that you belong to something. So it is certainly a penitential experience, but it's also a, a moment where, um, and there's many reasons why people reconnect for ashes. And, and in the book, I kind of go through a couple of them, but the one that always strikes me is belonging. Um, it, it, you, we are part of something bigger than, than ourselves. Uh, we're part of a community that takes us beyond even uh, even the people that, if we're if we're active churchgoers, even the people we see in the pews every week, um, it, it, it moves us beyond that. And those who aren't as engaged, it makes them feel like they they're part of something that's bigger than even the, whatever communities or, or or networks they're involved with. Um, it, it brings them closer to that. And it also there's a sense for many of, uh, especially many of those who are disaffiliated or, or who don't come. That it is a part of tradition. Um, it is something that feels very much that this is part of who they are as a religious person. Um, it's very much connected to identity and tradition. Um, and there, I mean, again, there's a variety. There's commitment. To commit, the commitment is also moderate. Um, it's very, um, uh, it, it's, 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 it's an achievable goal for people uh, that if 40 days of making a Lenten promise is certainly something that's important. And um, it is something that they feel that they can do, given the limited capacity. So, um, and there's many other reasons. I mean, Lent and Ash Wednesday are moments of rest and refuge. Um, and people who are inundated with the noise of the rest of the world, they very much uh, feel connected to, uh, to, the, to a season that allows them to kind of lay their cares on the Lord. And, and no matter where I've served pastorally, I've seen that whether it was in, in a, a high school setting, a college setting, a parish, a shrine, uh, a hospital. There, there's just, there is this desire that's there that's different. And, yeah. and you see then, you know, okay, the church now or chapel starts to fill up and, and the regulars, you know, they get there who, who come there, you know, to maybe give them, try and give them the evil eye, you're in my pew, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and so what are the ways in which we can become welcoming. I know is uh, one of the things, and you, you talk about this in your book, and it's something that I I have studiously tried not to do. Is like, you know, we're here every week, you know, so as the as the as the priest up there. And while I it, I think it, the thought is that that's welcoming, in some ways it could 
make it awkward for yeah. people and challenging. So what are some good ways in which we can do that kind of welcoming and uh, as a parish community or as a community anywhere that, that right. it has an Ash Wednesday service? Because they, they are in all different contexts of in the in the Catholic tradition, at least. Well, I think part of that is, as you're kind of hinting at, is it, it, I would say part of it is good preparation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, now that we are, you know, we're when we're recording this this conversation, you know, we're several weeks out from from Lent. So, getting ourselves prepared, um, I think, is a good thing. Preparing as individuals um, and to preparing preparing ourselves to kind of get past that cynicism. I, it, 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 as you say, it's it's sometimes I don't know if the, if we would necessarily always imagine as welcoming, but I think it's kind of a the, a new person sometimes make, I mean, anytime you encounter a new person, I know every time I go to, you know, a, a social gathering, if there's somebody I don't know, there's a certain sense of discomfort there. Mm -hmm. And it, so sometimes the humor is somewhat of a coping mechanism for us. <laughs> yeah, it's your, sorry, you're, oh, you're new, or you haven't seen me in a while. It, it, it helps us, but it certainly always doesn't help the other person. And so just being mindful of it, mm -hmm. um, going into it uh, without this cynicism or even uh even drawing more attention to the fact that they're not there i think that's the key thing um you know one of the i think one of the interesting things i discovered in talking to many people is even this notion you know we've we've gotten to calling individuals like this disaffiliated or the nuns but by doing that over and over again we're re we're defining them by what they are not uh we are defining mm -hmm. them by something that they lack as opposed to being uh, appreciative of who they are. And I think that that might, part of it is the preparation to approach those who we encounter on Ash Wednesday and throughout the season of Lent, not at, not defining them by what they lack, but by, by who they are. And I think that that might position us in a different way. So part of it is just training our mindset to think that way. Um, I, I, I was even thinking that perhaps in the weeks before Ash Wednesday, um, that churches perhaps can include in the prayers of the faithful, a very simple act, that we pray for those who will be making a, a reconnection with church um, during the Lenten season. And to make that as one of the prayers of the faithful that we would pray in the weeks leading up to it, just to get ourselves thinking pastorally, uh, compassionately, lovingly towards those individuals. Um, it's also good to start to, if there are people within our own families, to, to start to see them and to talk to them about it. Um, and so that's part of it. But then even on the day of, just going out of our way, um, greeting people at the door. Um, uh, we certainly want to make sure that we're mindful of those who are, who may not like that in your face uh, you know, very dynamic welcome. So we have to be very careful. We have to read people as they walk in the door. And if you sense that there is this discomfort with your very welcoming attitude, just, you know, dial it back a notch, but still make them feel like it is very important that we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, and to, uh, to address them by name, um, maybe even say, you know, we just want to, we want to welcome you. And if, if we can pray for you, I think that's the other thing too. Um, going through meeting people with a posture of prayer. What is there? What is it that I can pray for you for? Um, it puts them. It, it lets them know that they are being served. Um, that they are. Um, they are being uh, given an opportunity to to be a part of a community to belong, um, rather than know that they've they've just walked into a party for which they did they they may not have gotten the invitation for or they got mm -hmm. it late. Um, so putting people at ease just. Sometimes, you know, smiling a lot more. Um, and liturgically, if there are to be songs to be sung, you know, um, being very aware that not everyone knows the song that you've been practicing for four weeks since Christmas um, and that these are new people. So be, be kind to the people and, and, and help them walk them through even the music. Um, I was even thinking like the song Amazing Grace, for instance, I know that's kind of like a cliche church song, but that is a recognizable song and incredibly fitting for Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So why not belt out Amazing Grace perhaps during mass or services that weekend? I think a final thing I might say with that is we talk about people coming to 
uh, on Ash Wednesday. And, and so if you are in a position of leadership, how can you go out towards them um, on Ash Wednesday? Yes. Um, because ashes do not, they are, it is not a requirement that a mass be celebrated with the ashes. Ashes, that's, that's part of the, of the experience, certainly, but it's not required. So are there, uh, serve, are there are there prayer services for which we can go out into the community? One, of the, I love seeing colleges and universities where they take a classroom and they they designate that as an as a place to receive ashes. And and I've mm -hmm. seen I've seen bishops and priests and deacons and lay ministers lead services in a classroom in a college campus. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in when I worked in Chicago. Um, I remember on train platforms, um, I would see uh, ministers um, on train platforms just simply uh, waiting for people and, and stopping with them, praying with them for about five minutes. And then at the end of that, marking them with the sign of the cross and the ashes on their forehead. So um, those are radical examples of how we go to where people are as much as we do want them to come to us. I think it's a, I think there are many ways in which people can be approached that day. And, and you mentioned in your book that not only the ashes are people interested in, and that experience of that mm -hmm. day, but that there's a large number, uh, the studies have shown that there's a large number who carry forward Lenten practices, such as abstinence on fr Lenten Fridays or giving up something for Lent, some type of penitential act in that way. And you, you, you talk about those those other pieces that are beyond Ash Wednesday. So, yeah. how can we encourage and accompany people to return throughout Lent and and after Easter, given that they are that many are doing some of these things that are connected to the life of of faith? Well, it, one thing it could start again uh, preparation. Once again, to prepare for for Lent, it's good to prepare on Ash Wednesday. One way you can prepare on Ash Wednesday, for instance, is if you were to, um, in, for instance, in the in the in the pews, uh, in the seats, or when you encounter somebody on Ash Wednesday, um, if you certainly have a card for what can we pray for you, you may also want to have contact information. You know, how can we get in touch with you? Um, if you know. Uh, and, you know, if they willingly offer that up, then, you know, follow up with them. Um, you know, you, you know, if they, if they've said, you know, I, I really need prayers for my, for my mother, I need prayers for a job. I need prayers for, um, an illness that I'm, I'm, I'm currently struggling with. Um, so if those are what they're praying for, if they've also asked us to pray for them and they've given us their name and maybe an email or a phone number, um, I would say follow up, um, you know, and if you if if they don't, you know, if there are other ways that you can follow up with them, you know, certainly do that. Um, so certainly on Ash Wednesday, we can invite them into that through either them providing that information or that evening um, after Ash Wednesday services, you can certainly invite them to something and perhaps get to know them a little bit better. Um, I think part of it is it's the forming of a relationship um, and it's the beginning of a relationship. Um, so if you should talk to somebody in the back of church. Now, this isn't to say every person is going to meet, you know, 25 people. If you meet one person, if you engage in a conversation with one person on Ash Wednesday, whether you're a, a parish leader or, a, a, you know, a, a, just an active churchgoer, if you engage with that one person, hopefully, a, you know, you, you start to get to know them, even even in the, the narthex, the vestibule of your church, after the after mass or after a service or on the train platform or wherever you might be encountering them on Ash Wednesday, you know, get to know them and maybe use it as an opportunity to follow up and to to build that relationship throughout the season of Lent. Um, there's 46 days after Lent until we get to Easter that you have that time to be able to to uh, connect with them. Um, and maybe it, it doesn't have to be like the moment after you meet them, you're like, okay, so here's the church times and here's some envelopes. Um, and here's the list of all the activities you can get involved with. Maybe that's not the ambitiousness. Maybe we first just get to know with them, to know their needs um, and, and meet and connect with them throughout the season of Lent. So that's one way. Um, some of these people are, are, are in our own families, um, are, are, you know, if we're active churchgoers, but maybe our sons or daughters, our grandchildren may not be as frequent churchgoers, maybe using Lent as an opportunity to, to journey with them. Um, if they live within your same house, um, you know, certainly that's something you can do. I, one suggestion I have is 
is um, in there is every Thursday in Lent have a mini Mardi Gras. Um, and that on Thursday night, you know, make a big deal that tonight we're going to have something, maybe we're going to have some meat dishes or something that's really special because tomorrow is a fasting day. And uh, today, tomorrow is an abstinence day. And so on Thursday night, perhaps you do something very special to just draw attention in your household to it so that on, on Friday, then you, you you make sure that the peanut butter and jelly or the, the pastas or the pasta sauce is like out there in the kitchen where everyone can see it on Friday. And so it kind of is that visual reminder in the household if, if, the, if people are living with you. Now, if not, the other thing is, is Friday is a great day. To make a phone call um, to our sons and daughters, our friends, our, our maybe mm -hmm. texting them or sending them a, a message on on social media on Fridays, use making Friday the day that you reconnect with people, um, because again, like you said, the study shows that for as many people as we get on Ash Wednesday, that is nothing compared to the amount of people who give up things on Fridays and mm -hmm. Lent. Um, that number is staggering in, in, in relative comparison to the number who come on a weekly uh, basis to church. So Fridays is something very sacred to people. So uh, drawing a connection and calling up people on Fridays, perhaps during the Lenten season, I know many churches have stations, fish fries, spaghetti dinners on Friday nights. Well, think about how we're inviting those who are disconnected on those Friday nights. Um, you know, think about Stations of the Cross or the fish fry or the spaghetti dinner through the lens of somebody who isn't as familiar with the community. Um, you know, how can you make those encounter those experiences welcoming, making sure that the community, the, the, the community beyond your registered parish community knows about things like this, um, inviting people in the larger community to something. Um, you may maybe even making the language of it more uh, comfortable for somebody who isn't familiar with church jargon. Stations of the Cross may not be a phrase that is known to somebody who isn't as active in their faith, but in but an evening of encounter with Jesus is something that might make more sense. Um, are we indeed encountering Jesus? Yes. So it's not like you're false advertising, but you might have to rephrase how other people outside of those who are familiar with church would know what some of our Lenten customs mean. So, um, so those are just some ideas, and there, again, there's many that you can do, but Thinking at, of Lent through the lens of somebody who doesn't know our stuff, I think is is radically hospitable. And really, it's it's a form. What you're talking about it is is a form of evangelizing, and it, it, without proselytizing, but really right. walking with people and and being uh, going forth, being a missionary disciple, being an apostle. In fact, in one portion of your book, you. You quote uh, the the fourfold methodology of encounter, company, community, and send from the USCCB document, "Living as Missionary Disciples," and we have a lot of resources, as you know, because we worked with the bishops on that on that project, and and certainly it's part of what we're about as Catholic Apostolate Center. But so, how does Ash Wednesday then and the opportunities fit into the formation of missionary disciples? You know, as you would as you would see it, and. and in connection with living as missionary disciples or just the way that Pope Francis, but other popes, particularly from St. Paul the Sixth on, have really focused on how we can go forth and real and also the decree of the Apostle Lady. And you are the you are the uh, the person, the point person uh, for the USCCB around laity, but but particularly as church, not just laity, yeah. clergy, religious. How can we we really go forth and uh, and uh, as uh, at these Ash Wednesday services, but also throughout Lent, you know, I think the the, the fourfold measure of encounter, accompany, community, and sending. Um, first of all, there it, 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 it seems like a, a nice linear progression, but but you and I know that that the, that fourfold experience ebbs and flows, and it's more circular than it is linear. Mm -hmm. um, but the season of Lent. Being that it's 40 days and uh, with all of the things that that entails, um, it gives us time to accompany. It gives us time to give people encounters with Jesus, to give people encounter to to encounter each other's stories. So this encountering this uh, can happen several times throughout Lent. Um, th you know, this accompaniment is is long. I mean, you know, it's it's a patient journey for people. And I think that Lent gives us that time to be patient with people 
as they uh, as they grow. Um, I said before that that Ash Wednesday often gives people a sense of belonging. And so that notion of community that we're calling people to, that's part of it too, where you, you want to give people that positive experience of what community is, um, that it is a place where they are, their ideas are welcomed, where they feel a part of something bigger than themselves, where they can, um, where they can have the support systems that a community can provide. And where are we ultimately leading any of these encounters, which is to, to ground them in the mission of who God intended them to be in this world. Um, and I think that's what, when it comes to Lent, one thing I hear from a lot of people is that people are looking for a renewal, a second chance. Um, they, they, they know they have purpose in this world. They know they have meaning. And so Lent is often a time when they're introspectively searching for what does God want from me out of this world? And, and we have a word for that, which is vocation and mission. And that, of course, is what we're leading people towards. So we're helping them to be disciples, certainly by sitting at the foot of the Lord. But we're also challenging them to be who God intended them to be, their mission, their vocation. So they, we really are, I think, in Lent, Give, you know, starting on a journey with some people through this journey of missionary discipleship. And, and maybe some of it will happen. Maybe the, the mission part might actually come first before the community, or maybe the, maybe the, the encounter will come after the accompaniment. But it, 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 generally, those four elements are experienced if we patiently form a relationship with someone throughout the season of Lent and make our 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 kind of our resolution, our resolution as active churchgoers, to accompany at least one person through this season who needs it. You know, maybe it's somebody we know, maybe it's somebody we don't know, but we we're encountering for the first time uh, throughout the season. But uh, I think that's a good resolution for us to kind of uh, to be missionary disciples to someone else, so that we can form them into missionary disciples. For the next Lent or the next season, uh, when when they have an opportunity to then welcome someone in, and you've mentioned accompaniment on a number of, of occasions already, and it it it's, it really permeates so much of your uh, of your book. It's something I know you know in, in various contexts you've spent a lot of time reflecting on, talking about. I I love the quote on on page one eighty four. Ash Wednesday is like a laboratory for, lear for learning the art of accompaniment. So how is Ash Wednesday a laboratory for the art of accompaniment, which we know is something that's near and dear to Pope Francis, and we see it in Evangelii Gaudium, and you even quote Evangelii Gaudium number 169, and we at Catholic Apostolate Center have done lots and lots, and you you very graciously even, even note that uh, in your book, that, that we have many resources on, on the art of accompaniment, but where do you see these, these pieces connected, Ash Wednesday and the art of accompaniment? Well, that laboratory is an interesting word. And I, it, you know, you think about a laboratory, it's a place where you experiment. It's a place where you try things out. And sometimes you get things right, and then sometimes you don't. Um, and I think Ash Wednesday is a wonderful gift of the church to us, that we have this chance where people are drawn a little bit closer to the sacredness. They're, 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 Lent and Ash Wednesday is a time when when different populations of people, who some of whom may not normally feel comfortable in a church, for one day a year, maybe, maybe two days a year, but Ash Wednesday is definitely one of them, that they do feel comfortable. They do feel mm -hmm. that they're drawn in. There's a, that, they, that Lent gives them some, some meaning. So, so we're gifted in the fact that they have, they're giving us a chance. Um, because oftentimes with accompaniment, it means we have to go out. And, and that is what good accompaniment is. It is going out from ourselves and, and, and kind of leaving our comfort zone to, to journey with someone. But we know that it's scary. It's scary to do that because we're, like we said, going outside our comfort zone. So the, with this gift that we are given once a year, it's kind of like a, we, we have an opportunity. For, people are coming, they are coming to us, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so it gives us an opportunity to accompany. And if, if we can't do good accompaniment when they're coming to us, we're going to really struggle when we're when we're challenged by the Lord to go out um, because it's going to get even harder. So, so Lent and Ash Wednesday kind of gives us this 
this 40, 46 day laboratory experience where we can journey with somebody who is uh, a little more willing to go on that journey with us. And if we can accompany and we can get comfortable accompanying somebody through this season, which is, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's it's maybe not as difficult as it would be when we're accompanying someone at any other time of year or mm -hmm. in other circumstances. So Lent, in a way, gives us practice. Uh, I know I'm a, I'm a baseball fan, and so I kind of liken Lent to spring training. Mm -hmm. um, it's the time when the points don't count, um, <laughs> and we can... We can make as many errors and uh, we can swing at, to the fences and not hit the ball at all. And it doesn't count, but we try and we try and we, we, we get our swing going so that we have this um, so that when we do make it into the regular season, or should I say um, that kind of when, when things aren't as easy or as uh, as fluid as they would be for in, in Lent, um, we can do it and we feel confident and comfortable doing it in every Lent, this laboratory comes around again and we get to practice so that, you know, in the rest of our lives, uh, we can do this very well. You have a, a really great, and, and, and we, we get to practice, we get to practice this, but you've been practicing at this in terms of engaging people during this time of year for a, a fairly long time. And, and there's something about a, a passion play that kind of figures into <laughs> all of all of this uh, and, and this all of this reflecting and even the the maybe the little the beginnings of this book. Tell us about <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah. So, you know, when I go back home, so I'm originally from northwest Indiana, from the Diocese of Gary in Indiana, which is uh, which is a southeast suburb of Chicago. And uh, and that's where I grew up. And so when I go back there, I uh, one of the things when I was growing up, I had done and I'm known for now is um, I was that 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 young person who uh, who would direct his peers in a passion play during the season of Lent. Um, you know, you might think of me like Charlie Brown in a in in in, in, in it's you know the the Christmas uh, special. Um, you know, directing everybody and no one ever listens. And you know, so if any of my former cast members of my passion plays are listening, they know exactly what that is. I would you know, hey. But what was fun about it and what was joyous about it is that every Lent, again, it was this laboratory where for a few weeks we would practice the play and we'd mm -hmm. practice going through. And I would invite people who, uh, some who were very active in our church and some who weren't, but were friends with people. And so, you know, we would spend throughout the whole Lent doing that. And I did that in high school. I did that in, uh, and then I did it in college and, and soon I even got my fraternity brothers uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to, to play Roman soldiers and, you know, wear togas, uh, you know, and, and do those kinds of things. And it drew them closer into mm -hmm. the message. It drew them in closer into the story um, and to one another. Um, it grew a sense of fraternity and not just the fraternity that I was part of, but mm -hmm. Pope Francis's definition of fraternity, of, of, of brotherhood, of, of sisterhood, of, of what does it mean to really love and care for each other? It, 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 it drew us in that, but also it, 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 it kind of awakened us to the mystery. And so for me, I saw that year after year when this would happen, I, that more people would, would find a, a, a deeper connection to the sacred uh, through that very fun experience that again, I, I did, I did because I, you know, I, it was Lent and I wanted an opportunity to do something with my friends and this, this, you know, and I had a, I had a little bit of a theater, uh, bug in me. So I would, you know, say, Hey, let's, let's, you know, let's script it. And, you know, soon I would, you know, I even got my, my mom and dad and my families involved and we'd, starting building sets and things like that it was just kind of quirky but it it uh, gave us it gave us practice every literally we were practicing the play but it gave us practice in accompanying one another through the season and it kind of that kind of reminded me when i was writing this book of there are creative ways to do this um not everybody can was going to do a play but but thinking of things like what can you do with the season of lent what 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 did i do with it uh to really bring people at, along and, and on the journey with me. And, um, and I still talk to those people today and they still talk about it and how it was very moving for them. And, and that drew them into the sacredness of faith. 
Um, and some of them practice a little more than they used to. Some practice perhaps still a little, but for them, it still remains a kernel from which I think uh, things can build from. And, and we're this enthusiasm about Ash Wednesday and Lent, which ma many people are just not necessarily enthusiastic about, oh, here it is again. Oh, yeah. You know, and so why why should we take the, you know, there's all kinds of challenges out there. Why should we take the Ash Wednesday challenge this year? Well, first of all, the, the, the readings every Ash Wednesday, I don't know, we read the same readings every year. So it's good because we, um, we don't forget them in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the, 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 the opening reading from Joel. Uh, in Joel, the prophet Joel speaks of kind of uh, getting everybody ready for the onslaught of what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, prepare that, you know, pre just prepare yourselves, get ready for it. And because this time, this special time is about to come. Um, now he was speaking in prophetic language of the day of the Lord, but in our opportunity, for those who are active churchgoers, it kind of, that, that kind of compels us. Um, mm -hmm. St. Paul in his reading speaks of us being ambassadors for Christ. Um, and now is an acceptable time uh, to do this, um, that there's no time like the present to not do this. So I think we're challenged by the scriptures themselves to call us uh, to, to welcome the stranger, to, to be like the good Samaritan, to be like the shepherd of, of, with the sheep, and, and to, 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 to kind of keep in mind all those rich scriptural images that, that our faith gives us that compels us to be excited when when we have a, an opportunity to encounter somebody else whose story we don't know, um, I, I kind of I, I kind of say I wake up every Ash Wednesday more excited than almost any other day of the year. I wake up because I'm thinking, who am I going to meet today that I've never met before? Who is that person in the pew? Who is that that individual that I'm going to pass by with ashes on their heads and maybe have a conversation with that I've never had? I've never known their story, but maybe this day I will. And so. I'm about to bring into my story someone else's story. And to me, there's such joy. I mean, that's the joy of missionary discipleship is mm -hmm. being able to draw closer to others who are journeying towards the Lord. And Ash Wednesday is that day. I, I know on Ash Wednesday, we're supposed to kind of keep our hallelujahs a little quiet. Mm -hmm. But maybe in your heart, I'm just thinking, that does for me, I kind of I kind of sing a little hallelujah verse every two every Ash Wednesday because of those opportunities that come to yes. me. And I've had some great uh, encounters through the years on Ash Wednesday. I mean, yeah, those passion plays as a kid was certainly one, but I've had many others. In fact, I even today's today we're recording this is is Valentine's Day. And I, I actually met my wife uh, throughout during the season of Lent. Um, now, that was one chance encounter that really paid off later. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, it did. But um, but there are many opportunities to encounter people you'll never meet. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that it's like Ash Wednesdays in Lent or some, you know, big opportunity to, to you know, like a dating service or something. But you are, an, it does give you an opportunity to meet people. Um, it is, a, it is really a great meetup um, of the, of basically the people of God. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, neither, neither diet program nor dating service, but just the opportunities <laughs> that that are are there to to have those kinds of encounters to to get to know people, you know, people of faith and to walk with others. So we have a number of, uh, you know, you're a church leader, you, you're you're known in, in a variety of circles. You know, consider other other people who are church leaders. And what are some of the things that you would like them, you, you mentioned, you give a lot of practical tips here. I mean, it's great. Um, there's so many different ideas that are in this book and possibilities and are, are sure, certainly worth. But can you, what are a few things that you would like church leaders to consider as they do their, their future planning? And, and you really want them to be planning from about Christmas time on uh, in, and to get, the, get to get the community ready. So what are some things you would like them to, like church leaders to be thinking about? So there's an old season in the church calendar called Septuagesima. Uh, and um, it, it meant the 70 days before Easter. And it was this pre-Lenten preparation period for church leaders um, that was very common in the Middle Ages. It's where the kind of we have the rise of carnival comes from because people before Lent were were stashing away and 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 eating and 
getting rid of the meats and cheeses and temptations, uh, and they were preparing their churches for Lent. Um, it was this pre-Lenten Lent uh, experience. So my challenge, I think, to a lot of the church leaders is to kind of revive that spirit, uh, to revive that preparation period. Um, I would say, and I, I think I'd begin by saying the first part of that would be prayer. Um, I think that it would be important that as church leaders, first, we we pray we pray for uh, for those who are we are about to meet. Um, we pray for them before we even meet them um, because we know they're out there. And I would say not a prayer like the tax collector in the temple or the, you know the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know the, the, the holy person and the tax collector in the temple and the, 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 the holy Pharisee says, oh Lord, I'm not, not that kind of prayer like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not like those who don't come to church um, because again, that's going to lead us to that encounter on Ash Wednesday where we go. It's, oh, it's good to see you again but rather to pray for them as a son and daughter of God, to pray for the needs that they might have. Uh, what are they struggling with? What is it that's keeping them and, and giving them the benefit of the doubt? Like, is there something in their heart that's, that, that keeps them away from church? Is there a hurt? Is there, um, is there any struggles in their lives? Is there a busyness that just is eclipsing everything else is there a commitment that that seems to be driving things more than a commitment to uh, to their faith tradition? That that what is it the thing that's overstressing them? That's giving them that pressure um, that draw, that keeps them at, a, at at arm's length. That perhaps on Ash Wednesday doesn't. So whatever it is, I think I think first of all, my advice would be to pray for them, to pray with them, um, to pray with their needs. And then, um, so hopefully that will give us a spirit that, you know, when we meet a person for the first time on Ash Wednesday or during the season of Lent, we've already met them in our hearts because we've been praying with them. So I think that's the first thing is to kind of keep that septuagesima spirit going that we pray. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's good for us as we prepare um, to learn a little bit more about those who disconnect. I just mentioned a couple potential reasons in prayer that might come up of why people disconnect from church. And I listed in my book a couple of reasons that people have given why they normally wouldn't go, but that they do go um, on in, in Lent. And to really think through that and to think through who are these individuals, especially, and I, it's close to my heart because of the ministry I work in, but especially young adults. Um, there are many of the people, in fact, the studies show that actually young adults are actually more apt to come on Ash Wednesday and more apt to give things up during Lent than some of the older generations would be during this season. So, um, so there's something to be said. So I think part of it is whether they directly engage with young adults or not, but to learn about them, to learn about how the church can respond to them, how can they invest in them, how can they accompany them through whatever means they have. So learning about young adults and then, uh, you know, learning, the, learning about evangelization, learning about accompaniment, learning that evangelization is not proselytization. So reading some of those resources from the bishops from the Catholic Apostolate Center and what does it really mean to accompany, I think that's helpful. Um, because I think we have this idea of, oh, okay, you want me to, on Ash Wednesday and during Lent, just invite them to the soup supper we have or to our station service or to our parish mission. That's what I have to do. No, not necessarily. Accompaniment means more than just let me give you a, a flyer. Um, it means getting to know a person. And so, mm -hmm. and that, I think the, one of the best ways we can do that is to strengthen the domestic church. Is it our sons and daughters? Is it our grandchildren? Is it our relatives? Is it, is it our close friends who maybe that relationship is in need of, of, of repairing? So as church leaders, yeah, we're called to minister to the whole community, but in a sense, we can't take ourselves out of the equation. And we ourselves have family. We ourselves have friends. We have people on social media we interact with. How are those relationships? You know, so if we can, if we can manage and, and if we can navigate how to, how to, grow in our personal relationships, um, especially those who are estranged from or distant from our churches, um, then it gives us the the tools we need and the confidence they need to be able to accompany those for whom we have no connection at this point, um, but might during the season of Lent. So a lot of, I think my advice to church leaders is to prepare um, and to start preparing as soon as possible. Um, as soon as this webinar is done, I think that's the best time to start, if not earlier. Um, and if they don't get it, if, if this year it's too soon, then there's always another Lent that comes around. And 
I think perseverance and patience is another thing that I would say is even if you don't get it right, again, this is like spring training. Even if this spring training didn't work out, there'll be another spring training next year. And and we as a community can do it great because Lent's going to keep coming around. And, um, and that's you know. where the virtue of hope does come in. And again, the book is Hope from the Ashes, Insights and Resources uh, for Welcoming Lenten Visitors by Paul Jarzembowski. We have a, also a foreword by uh, Bishop Frank Cajano. Uh, one of our favorites, and several several people have endorsed the endorsed the book. It's available from Paulus Press. If you have any questions, please put those either in the chat or in the question section. We'll be taking a look at those as well. We also have a, a special a coming up that will be released uh, toward the end of February. A special one hour on mission podcast with Paul, where he also gets into some of the the history of Ash Wednesday and some of the and of Lent. Uh, as well as some of the things that we've heard today and goes a little bit more in depth in those. We do have a question here. So what are some good habits to build up giving up for Lent, uh, to build up for giving up for Lent? I find too often people treat Fridays and Lent as punishment right. instead of as fish sticks, instead of opportunity to grow in their faith in ways more positively than just giving up chocolate and then treating it as as some kind of punishment. So you know, maybe a little adjustment of attitude. I don't know. What, what's, what's your thought I, on that, Paul? You know, I yeah, in Lent, I think, you know, the, the question of, you know, giving up, and that, that is certainly a, one of the wonderful components, the fasting component of Lent. But I think that there is also, Lent is for many people, a, 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 as I said, a period of rest, a period of refuge. Um, and And so... What are the things, I think the other thing too is, what is it that we need to surrender to the Lord in terms of what is it, what is the anxieties? What is it that's keeping us overwhelmed? Um, because when we find ourselves at, at the at the end of a rope that we're just so tied up in knots because of overcommitment, of over-anxiety, of over-stress, whether that's because of our work our, our family obligations are just the general expectations of culture, the pressures we're maybe under with our finances, with our careers, with whatever it might be. What are those things that are, that are weighing us down that we can, I think, you know, find refuge in the Lord and surrender those things. So in addition to just giving up the, giving up stuff, it's giving up the things that are weighing us down and letting the Lord hold us during the season of Lent. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why people do connect with Lent so much is because it is a season of refuge. And I think some of us who are very active don't always see it that way. We see it yes. by the requirements. And I think that the requirements serve a greater purpose, and that is recognizing that God is there to, to walk with us. We, you know, he is there to journey with us. And sometimes we're letting those things, the anxieties, the pressures, I think they cloud our vision and they kind of prevent us from seeing the world as God sees the world with joy and passion and love. Um, and so sometimes that would be one thing of what we want to do for make a good Lent, I think, is to find those things. And Find the things that you need to give up so that you can rest in God mm -hmm. and God can hold you in his hands and, and allow you that peace that he so longs for your life. Great. We have a, another question here. What are your, uh, you're asking us both really, your favorite Lenten practices outside of Ash Wednesday and how does it help you in your encounter with Christ? And then how can it help both current churchgoers and people who may be interested in the faith? Um, one of the things, one of my favorites is near the end of Lent. I love the the the, the, the Holy Week drama for me is very uh, important. And maybe it has those roots in the in my in my passion play <laughs> yes. experience that the drama of the Holy Week is very special. And so on Holy Thursday, there is a tradition in the church where after the the Mass of the Lord's Supper. Um, to go and make a tour of seven churches and visit the Lord in uh, in the altar of repose on on Holy Thursday evening. Many churches stay open till 10, 11, midnight even. Um, 
where the where the where the blessed sacrament is available and so i love that tradition because it's like a pilgrimage experience it's a mini pilgrimage where i get to to to, to journey sometimes many times with others who are making this trip from church to church and praying uh, at the Lord, you know, kind of in, as, as if we were in the garden, praying at the different stops along the way. That's a tradition I love. And that to me is something that I've actually used to draw others to, to kind of a sacred experience at Holy Thursday. When I was a diocesan leader, um, we would organize a bus pilgrimage um, with the bishop, um, some young people um, on Holy Thursday night. We would take a bus from church to church to church. Um, and, 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 and sometimes if the churches were close enough, we would actually walk the streets uh, that, in the late evening with one another um, from church to church. Um, so I used a tradition that was very that was very special to me. And as a pastoral leader, I used that. I shared that passion by finding what are ways that I can invite someone who may not necessarily um, be as familiar with that custom. And so we would call it the Midnight Pilgrimage. Um, it sounded like an intriguing title. We would post it around town and we'd get some people to join us. So um, so yeah, there's, there's a variety. That was something that for me was very special and also a way that I would then able to transform it. So for, I would say my advice is, what is something that drives you and then, you know, how can you use that to invite others into deeper into the mystery? How for, about you, Father Frank? You know, for me, it's it's the not only the giving up of something, but also the the prayer practice, uh, or an almsgiving practice, or a fasting practice that I can do all throughout Lent, and and then make it a habit, because they say you can grow a habit in you know in about six weeks' time, a good one or a bad one. And, and that I could develop something that by the time we get to Easter would be mm -hmm. something around prayer or fasting or almsgiving. And then I wouldn't do it the following year because now it's a habit. Now it's just yeah. part of part of what I do. And, and there have been many different things that have just now become part of my regular routine that I would begin in Lent. Um, and, and that I have found helpful. So now uh, what Lenten practices should a parish be recommending to the pastor now for the pastor to do or for the, <laughs> I, I don't think that's what's being asked here. I think it's more in terms of, you know, that a parish pastoral council, maybe recommendations that they might be giving to, to the, um, to the parish as, as to what they might be able to do. You know, one thing, one of my, uh, one thing that could be possibly done is um, to, to coordinate some sort of post Ash Wednesday um, gathering, perhaps, um, like a soup and bread evening, maybe maybe a speaker series, or maybe just a, a, a an opportunity for a meet and greet um, after Ash Wednesday. Um, unlike Christmas and Easter, other very uh, remarkable moments of return for people during the liturgical year, Ash Wednesday doesn't have a lot of competition afterwards. So it'd be easy to ask somebody to stay for an extra 45 minutes or an hour um, to say, you know, you know, join us. Um, so that would be something like coordinating things like that. Um, also, with, with regard to Ash Wednesday, I think being attentive to, and if, for maybe for the pastors, there's art and environment, and then maybe there's even the homily. I would, I, I think that any pastors, certainly just keeping in mind um, those who are in our midst on that day. I mean, um, for many people, that homily is probably the, one of the few times a year they're hearing from, um, from a person of faith to speak um, you know, on, 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 to speak on the scriptures, to unpack, uh, the message. Um, so of course, making that message, uh, keeping the people who are, who wouldn't normally hear it in mind, uh, again, with that compassionate heart, not cynical heart. Um, I've seen way too many homilies begin with a joke on the, for the, to the expense of the person that isn't there. So certainly keeping that in check. And then throughout the season of Lent, um, like one, one idea I had in the book is uh, host stress relief nights during the season of Lent. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes do parish missions, which are wonderful, but using phraseology like a stress relief night, um, mm -hmm. where maybe you hold it on a couple of nights so that mm -hmm. people aren't stressed out by having to make the one night that you hold it, um, but really having a couple of opportunities, maybe, and, and really that could be a Teze service. Maybe that is uh, Lexio Divina, maybe that's a rosary, an evening of the rosary or, a, or an evening of Eucharistic adoration, but to, to present it to somebody who is overstressed, um, and maybe using language that might make more sense. So maybe create, think up of creative 
ways in which Lent can be done, not just using the, the traditional words that we would use because those who know it might understand it, but use language that uh, would appeal to somebody who is not as familiar. Once they come, once there's that invitation, we can certainly share with them other phraseology that we are used to in the church, the vocabulary that mm -hmm. we are used to. But to somebody who's who's new, just keep Lent, Lent from the perspective of somebody who, you know, again, goes only a few times a year to church and may mm -hmm. have the last time they really thought about church may have been that confirmation class they had 20, 30 years ago. So just keeping those people sympathetically in mind. Great. Thank you. And thank you for this conversation, Paul. It's been wonderful. It's always great to, to be together with you, uh, whether online or in, in person. Again, Paul's book is Hope from the Ashes, Insights and Resources for Welcoming Lenten Visitors, available from Paulus Press. It's Paul Jarzembowski. We are so happy for you. Congratulations on this book, uh, which will be is, is just not only timely, uh, as we, we're about to enter into Lent, but also uh, just give so many opportunities and resources. Uh, and you can also go to catholicpostletcenter.org for a number of Lenten resources. We It's one of our most popular pages. As I said, there's also an on-mission podcast that's coming up. You can go to catholicpostletcenter.org for the resources or catholicpostletcenterpodcast.com for the, the podcast. And this uh, Webinar will be available on those resources soon as well and, and on our YouTube page. And we'll also have the audio available on our podcast site under our resources podcast site. So again, thank you, Paul, uh, and many blessings in, in your all, all the different work that you do for the church in the United States and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And may the charity of Christ urge us on.